I'm going to start straight away with our first speaker, who is Sean Wallace. Sean, can you introduce yourself? Where are you from? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Sean Wallace. I'm, I'm from, the, um, from UCL, and, and from, uh, the, uh, I'm on the UCU National Executive Committee. Um, this, this, the meeting ti is titled um, Neoliber Neoliberalism and Resistance, and I want to talk a bit about the neoliberalism before we get on to talk about the resistance. I'm sorry about that, but we, we, we had two things in the title we thought we ought to talk about. First one, um, what's happening in higher education is a, is a story that perhaps, uh, perhaps everybody in the room is familiar with. Um, the Tory government um, thought it was going to get in uh, in 2011, sorry, 20, in 2010, thought it was going to get in without going into coalition, proposed essentially a, 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 what was called the Willits Plan, a full-scale privatisation of the university sector. And that plan consisted of several elements, which, because they were in coalition with the Liberal Democrats, we were forced to implement in stages. What they did is they charged £9,000 fee, they uh, removed the block grant, underwriting um, all departments, so that uh, only some departments got a block grant, and, and what it meant was that e your, your finances then depended on your ability to recruit students. In 2014, instead of implementing it in one go in 2014, uh, they removed the cap on student numbers. Those two things, putting a £9,000 fee, turning the whole of the university de department's finances and teaching terms into how many students you could recruit, and then removing any cap on the number of students you could recruit, was like pouring petrol on a fire. Immediately, universities started to expand and expand and expand their capital base. They poured money into buildings. They poured money into new campuses. And they started looking at profit maximization. Very crudely, they started looking for closures of departments, closures of courses, and so on. They started attacking the statutes. They're attacking, attacking all sorts of things. We documented this in the alternative white paper for higher education, which was published uh, in 2016. We had a campaign in parliament, a convention. We had two, two national, big national meetings involved quite a big, a big united front um, between the left, UCU left members like ourselves and, and people really quite far to the right of us in ca the Council for the Defence of British Universities. This was a broad, very broad united front to try and defend the status quo of the idea of a university being something that was for working class and ordinary people to come to to benefit in, uh, themselves and to be benefit society. It was a democratic instrument. A, a, a democratic forum, a space for, for, for society to reflect on itself and to criticise itself. And that was under attack. And then in 2016, of course, we have the HE bill and the Tories then rush to uh, go to election and they go into crisis. We have Brexit and so on. It's important to set the scene because what was happening was a accumulation of a number of factors that had taken place up to that point, but then it was massively intensified. And this is the scene, we didn't predict it at the time, but this was beginning to undermine the pension scheme in the old universities. Because as universities went into competition with each other, they started to see their interests as being absolutely counterposed to each other instead of being mutual. It, they were talking about let's, what happens when the university down the road goes bankrupt. And what does that mean to our university finances if we're exposed to their bankruptcy risk? What, what about when we're borrowing and we have to go to the city and they say, OK, what have we got on our balance sheets? Well, actually, you've got pension risk. So suddenly you get pensions becomes this new focus for the management of the universities. That's the context in which we start the fight to defend USS pension scheme. And by, because we grasp that, from the left, we put an argument and we put an argument which said that the fight to defend the USS pension scheme was not just a fight to defend pensions, but it was a fight to defend the whole university. And at the beginning, we were the only people putting that argument. We were going around work departments, we were going around different colleges making that argument. But we were the only people making it. It wasn't coming from UCU officials, it was coming from the left. But as a result of, the, by the time we were on strike, you were hearing that argument being bounced straight back at us on the picket lines. Young people coming, to the, coming onto the into the strike, whether they be young PGTAs or people who literally had just started working at the university, joined the union, went on the picket line two days later. Join, uh, joining the union and going on the picket line within the space of a couple of days and then picketing for 14 days during the strike. That was, a, that was what gave it that explosive and 
uh, you know, inter intergenerational um, aspect. It was that. And it was because we did that across in university after university, not just where we were organized, you see that replicated to a greater or lesser extent. But it ma it, and it, with that upsurge, the upsurge lifted a whole generation of people in the universities into the unions and into the, a sense of self-belief and a realization that they had industrial power that the first lesson that people learned was that by going on strike in large numbers and by the passive support of the majority of people who, didn't, who may not even be members of the union, but they weren't going to come in and cross the picket lines, having won the political argument, won a hegemonic argument behind the strike, we were then able to, to carry out some very effective strikes. At UCL, we had 200 people on the picket lines on a daily basis. We had mass meetings every day. We had over 100 people at those meetings. Um, uh, we were str dr struggling with people to get them off the picket lines to actually come to the meetings. We became very, very important. Now, I just want to, 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 to make a couple of, uh, of points, many of which, were, and, and then I'll pass over to other speakers who've got a lot more to say about the actual dispute. I just wanted to set the scene. One is that I think it's important to understand the role of the trade union bureaucracy in this. It's easy now to look at Sally Hunt and say, look, Sally Hunt was out to sell the dispute out. Actually, that's not true. Sally Hunt and the left... In the, on the national executive, were instrumental in making sure the strikes happened in the first place. She gave a nod to all of the action, and she sh shut down the right wing, the IBL, on the, uh, in the national executive in the higher education while the strike was going on, as was build, it was building, to get the, the, the vote out when we beat the, the, the threshold, but also to get the strikes out and to get them happening. She was on the side of all of those of us who were making that argument. But... Once there was an offer on the table from the UUK, she was looking for her exit strategy. And it was at that point that you start to see all the, the, the vault fast from the union bureaucracy. And they start to uh, demonstrate their, 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 their interest, and much more, they see their interest much more in terms of uniting uh, to stop the strike rather than uniting to win the dispute. And that's, that question is now the question that faces the UCU more generally. And whilst there's lots of rank of file groups that have been thrown up, nobody else apart from us is talking openly about the role of the trade union bureaucracy. Not USS briefs, not uh, rank and file who don't even know what the US union bureaucracy is and don't have an analysis of it, uh, not the, the branch solidarity network. It's only UCU left members who are making that argument. And, if we don't, and, and that's crucial to the question of democracy going forward because if you stand for a position and you don't engage with the fact that you're dealing with people who will pull one way and then the other way, and you're not accountable to members, and you don't understand the, 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 that you're going to be pulled in that direction, then you can be pulled into the union bureaucracy. You can be pulled, uh, you know, you can be, you can be sucked into the argument that, you know, we need to look for an exit strategy and so on. So it's absolutely crucial that if you, we're, we're looking at re-energizing and, re, re, and transforming UCU, which we go on to talk about, that we understand the importance of the, a, a, a Marxist analysis of the trade union bureaucracy. With the workers always, with the bosses never, with the bureaucracy sometimes. Thank you very much, Sean. Okay, I'm going to move straight to our next speaker, who is Carlo Morelli, and Carlo is from Dundee University and also a UC, was a USS negotiator. Thank you. I can't wait. So, sorry, this is a bit out of kilter, but I've got a train to get at, um, to run off for, for half two. That's why I'm kind of jumping in here and, and going to disappear out the door in a bit short while, I'm afraid. Um, I want to say a little bit about the negotiations and actually where that's got to in terms of USS and, and where that, I think, is going to lead to in the next few months. Um, and I, I don't want to deal with the dispute itself, because I think Josh and Nita will talk much more about that and have more time to. But I think it's extremely important to understand the way in which the negotiations around USS started to emerge. Um, and to do that, I think we have to go back, following on from what Sean has said, about the political economy of pensions and what was taking place in the run-up to the dispute and the valuation process. The valuation process has gone on for three three uh, cycles. Each cycle has been aimed at trying to chip away and undermine our pension scheme. The reason why that's been the case is that pensions have been seen for a long time as an avenue in which much higher levels of profit can be gained in the financial sector. If you can transfer those savings um, and investments 
from areas in which they are protected from uh, speculation into areas in which commissions can be generated on much greater levels. And that's what the shift from defined benefit into defined contributions is about. It's about the financialization of our pensions in order to generate much higher returns for the financial sector and at the risk of those who are reliant upon those pensions, you and me and others. And that process has been going on for well over a decade. Um, and USS is not unique to that. It's part of this whole process. And the two changes that have taken place in the two previous rounds were very fundamental. The ending of the final salary scheme and then the partial introduction of a defined contribution scheme. And back in last March, or March before last, um, that's when the valuation cycle started again. And on the back of those two failed attempts to protect our pension scheme, it was clear the employers and USS themselves had, a, had set themselves on a course for not just cuts in the pension scheme, but a wholesale restructuring of it. How big a restructuring wasn't clear when this process started. But by the end of last summer, it was starting to be much clearer that they were talking about almost the abolition of the defined benefit pension scheme and the almost total introduction of a defined contribution scheme. By the end of last year, in November, it became clear that wasn't enough for them. They wanted to go lock, stock and barrel and get rid of the whole defined benefit scheme and push everyone onto a defined contribution scheme. So that's where we got to in terms of the run-up to the dispute. And that comes from the, the, the political economy of pensions themselves. Now, fast forward three or four months to the end of the dispute is where did we get to there? Um, the, the way in which the dispute was settled was not in a settlement of the pension scheme. Instead, a pausing of the whole thing through the setting up of this thing called the Joint Expert Panel. In other words, to push the, the evaluation of the scheme and the settlement of the dispute into a, a, a side room whereby some form of compromise could emerge. And here, I, I wanna, this is what I want to really talk about, is what kind of compromise can emerge because it's not clear that a compromise can emerge. There is a fundamental problem with the way in which what's this thing called JEP, the Joint Expert Panel, is set up and what it's seeking to do, which could easily, in my view, lead to the dispute erupting again in the autumn at the same time as we're talking about a major national dispute over pay emerging, which I think are both are strong possibilities. And, and this is it. The Joint Expert Panel is supposed to do two things. One is it's supposed to evaluate the current um, valuation, make a judgment on the, the uh, valuation that USS have undertaken, and also come up with a way in which a pension scheme can be valued in the long term, the methodology. So the valuation, the current valuation, and the future methodology are the two things it's supposed to look at. The first issue is problematic. Why? Because you've got an institution in USS which has set its, its stall out in terms of the way in which it runs a pension scheme. It is now under scrutiny. And USS itself is now putting barriers in the way of trying to ensure a valuation can be, under, can be assessed. And that's where there's a debate to be had. That's a technical issue about liabilities, a technical issue about um, valuation of returns, and blah, blah, blah. But fundamentally, there's a political issue here. And it's the political issue that's the problem in, uh, in uh, causing the joint expert panel to have a real crisis. And the political issue is the way in which um, pension schemes are to be run. Are they to be run for the members or are they to be run for the benefit of the financial sector? And the, the way in which European Union regulations come into pension schemes, imposing these the certain types of valuation. That's the fundamental problem they've got. And the, the difficulty with that is that the industry itself is, is uh, wedded to a neoliberalism of um, understanding of pensions and the way in which retirement should be understood. In other words, abolishing it and getting rid of it and making impoverishing pensioners to force them to work longer uh, and for lower pay and so on and so forth. That's the political problem they've now got. And in my view, it's not clear the Joint Expert Panel will be able to resolve that. Fundamentally, because it's not a technical issue. It's a political issue. And the political issue can't be resolved. Why? Not because there's not an unwillingness to, to develop the neoliberal agenda into pensions. That's 
That's what got us into this in the first place. There is a blockage allowing neoliberalism to be driven through in the higher education sector. And the blockage is us. We are the body that have stopped it in its tracks, and we continue to be the body that is making a huge blockage in trying to drive through a neoliberal understanding of pensions. And that's why the pension scheme dispute isn't settled and can easily erupt again if there's an attempt to try a second time to push this through. And that's really where we're at in terms of the negotiations around the Joint Negotiating Committee. Uh, I, I don't know in terms of what's happening with Jeff. It's all completely secret, and it's deliberately so, but secrecy tells you everything. You need to know about what's probably happening in there. But that's really where the fundamental problem is. There is a membership of an institution called a union which have taken strike action and are clearly willing to do it again if there's an attempt to undermine the pension scheme further. And it's the political problem they've got in resolving this, not the technical problem um, that's really fundamental to this. I'll leave that there. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much to Carlo. <coughs> um, I'm going to move straight on now to our, our third speaker, um, who is Nita Sangera. Nita is at Bourneville College, and she's also the new elected vice president of UCU. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, uh, we're talking about transformation. We're talking about resistance. And you see before you, we are transforming. I am here. I am part of that transformation, something that's never been seen before within our union. So it's like this perfect storm has happened. I mean, who'd have thought that academics would be on strike? Academics, okay? No one in a million years would have thought that our academics would be on strike. That's a transformation in itself. Not for one day, not two days, but 14 days. And that's, that's easily said than done. I went on some of those pickets. And it was absolutely bloody freezing. But they were absolutely huge. And what also, you know, I was like pretty gobsmacked about was the organization. The organization was, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say military fashion. Um, so it was absolutely amazing. All of the activists that were there, they did such an amazing job. And I need to give a little bit of a, a nod to FE as well. That's further education for those that don't know it. We too are balloting and we, you know, the, the ballots that are going to go on further because of this transformation that we've had within the union, this, this huge surge of this huge academic power surging through our union. I mean, who'd have thought that UCU, an academic union, would be showing the likes of Unite and Unison the way to go? So they need to follow and, you know, they're a little bit behind us and to say that an academic union is surging the way forward as far as unionism is concerned is absolutely amazing. All right, the PCS are going to be out as well in, in September. Further education is going to be out. HE most likely will be out. It's going to be absolutely huge. I mean, it's, it, it's the nearest we can get to. Somebody's been talking about general strikes. So, you know... That is the way forward. That is the only way that we're going we're gonna to transform as we have started to do. The transformation is happening. We have many, many, like, many, like Sean was saying, we've got the, the Solidarity Network. We've got rank and file. Those are all left units. But the way that, you know, the, the union that's showing it, the, the part of the union that's showing everything for it is UCU left. UCU left got me where I am today. I couldn't have done it without them. Um, so we need to give credit to UC. We are organized, you know, and bringing on the rank and file is what we need to do. Bringing on the solid solidarity networks. They're, 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 they're new and they're looking, us, looking to us to, to make that transformation. That neoliberal argument that we keep on hearing about, neoliberalism is dying. It's, it's, it's dying within, within our union. Those IBLers, I mean, I was at FEC on Friday and... They, they were so deflated. They had to get the president in, who happens to be an IBL. They had to get the president in to like lift them up because when she wasn't there, they were just shoulders down and they, they, they couldn't look us in the eye. It was like because they know the power is now with UCU left, the power in that transformation that is going on every day. I mean, the holidays are with us at the moment, but we're not stopping. We're going to carry on. We're going to carry on building. And the structures of our union, they are also in transformation. We've got the 
NEC elections. That's our national executive elections coming on. And we are already starting to build for that because Sally Hunt is Sally Hunt. She's just the face of the union. She, you know, the reality is she, she's just a face. And if we get rid of her, there'll just be another right-wing face. So we need to build from the bottom. And those structures that we're, tr you know, it might take 12 months, it might take 18 months, but the transformation has started. And we need to build and go through those structures because it's only the structures, when we change those structures, is when we're going to have like a solid platform to carry on the transformation of our unions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nita. Okay, our last speaker from the top table is Josh Holland. Josh is a UCL, UCU, and he's a post-grad rep. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for coming along. I know there's lots of choice. I shouldn't say that because you'll run out the door now. Um, I, I want to take things back a little bit because I think from, from the position where we're at now, after that 14 days of really inspiring strike action, it, it, you know, it did shift uh, the terrain and it did shift where we're up to in terms of uh, battling uh, neoliberalism and battling the corporate agenda within universities. But I think it's worth taking it back because... You know, thinking about uh, the mobiliser, I, I joined UCU uh, a year ago, by the way. I'm a postgraduate uh, teaching assistant at UCL, a TA. Um, and obviously, you know, through this strike, 16,000 more people like myself have joined the union, uh, mainly on the picket lines, mainly because they saw that we were taking action. And I, I want to talk a little bit to start with about, you know, mobilising for that vote. Because like Nita was saying and like others were saying, we're coming up for another fight uh, in the autumn. This isn't going away. I think we're actually entering a new normal where we're going to have to continually, uh, you know, fight a war of attrition for uh, higher education, for further education, for the concept of education in this country that isn't simply run for profit. It's not about job cuts. It's not about pay cuts. Um, and, and so what I want to start with is, is thinking about uh, mobilizing for the vote. And I think it's worth saying, you know, don't let anyone ever tell you that it's not worth knocking on doors, putting up leaflets, putting up flyers, talking to your colleagues about uh, getting their ballot papers in. I'm, I remember um, at, at UCL, actually, I'm going to use the UCL uh, thing because that's where I'm at, um, as an example, but I remember like senior management would say, oh, they're not going to take strike action. Oh, there's a vote, but you know, it's not going to happen. They're not gonna, you're, not, you're never going to take two days strike action, let alone 14 days. And then we took the first two days of strike action and they said, oh, don't worry about it. They won't take the next three days after the weekend. People will start to feel the pinch. And then they took three days and we went out on a massive march in the snow through central London and people were really boosted and we went back to work. And I remember going back to work on that Thursday after the, you know, this march that's on the screen now is on, on the Wednesday. And uh, people kept winking at me in, uh, around here, around Bloomsbury. It's a very strange experience for me. People don't tend to wink at me in the street. And uh, I don't know why. But, uh, but you know, it, it, like, pat, patting me on the back, because you know, they would see the UCU stickers and they would see your badge. And you know, what happened, especially in those first few days, on the, on the picket lines uh, was w you started to feel like something was shifting here. Uh, and then, you know, back to senior management. Oh, okay, well, you know, you're not going to go out for four more days. You can't possibly do that. That's not going to happen. And then what happened? Monday, back out. It was even more solid. I remember people joining us on, you know, library services, professional services were saying, I didn't feel like it. I thought this was a lecturer strike. Of course it wasn't. You know, in, in, in higher education, it was about everyone fighting for their pensions, students and staff uh, alike. And so it's, you know, there, there's obviously a benefit uh, to getting the vote out because we need the vote. We want people uh, to vote for, for action. But it also means that you get to have uh, serious conversations with people. And this is where I think it was really transformative. Um, Sean's already stolen my, you know, my, my great headline that we had 200 people, 300 people out on picket lines every day around UCL. Sometimes it felt a bit thin because actually UCL has so many... Um, satellites and campuses and stuff but the inspiring thing about that was that it, it was people within their workplace came out they were outside uh, they were arguing with their colleagues not to go in and they were winning them and on those picket lines you really started to feel uh, you know um, how you know the kind of education that we need the fact that you know we started to talk about payload 
on workload, we start, sorry, workload. Uh, we started to talk about the gender pay gap. We started to talk about uh, the struggles of tier four students, of PGTAs who are having pressure put on them to spy on their Muslim students because of the government's prevent agenda. And we started to think about what has education become in this country? You know, especially my, my first year at university was 2010 when they raised tuition fees. And we went out and, you know, we marched and some people smashed up Millbank and things. Uh, and that was all very inspiring. But you kind of felt for a few years, oh, this is really, <laughs> this, is, this is it now. And then to be back out on the picket lines, to be having those daily strike meetings in which we can say, actually, this isn't what, um, what we're supposed to be doing. We should be fighting for an education that's not, you know, you don't look out into a lecture theatre and say, okay, well, that's, that student's worth 22 grand, that student's worth 12 grand, that student's worth 9 grand. No, it's about education. It's about fighting uh, for, you know, wh what our students need and, and for the needs of society, not for uh, profit. I want to um, spend a little bit of time talking about the middle of the strike because I think uh, really this is where the rank and file came into it. And for a lot of us, I've got to be honest, I've, I've been a Socialist Workers' Party member for about a decade now. I know I look about 12, but I have been. <laughs> um, and uh, it can be a bit abstract when you, uh, when you stand there with, with the paper, everyone else's picket lines and stuff. Uh, but this was, it was so transformative. You started to really feel the power of being in a union, but also about, you know, you came up against the bureaucracy. So halfway through the strike, like people have said, we got given an offer. It was a terrible deal. It was, uh, you know... Uh, I'll let Carlo and Sean can answer all the uh, all the ins and outs. But actually, you know, people knew straight away that that wasn't what they were fighting for. They didn't take 14 days of strike action, or at that point, eight days of strike action, to be sold down the river. And so what we did, and this was because, it, you know, we were having daily strike meetings. And this is, uh, you know, th why it's so essential is because you, then you can react to what comes up from the bosses and from the union bureaucracy, is that we marched on the headquarters. And uh, we, we, we took a march from, from UCL, and it was lots of uh, different campuses came in behind it in central London. Uh, we, we went up, and, and we, we launched the hashtag no capitulation, which is really great. And, and what we did out there, w which I think was really useful, was as delegates were going in to vote on uh, whether to accept the uh, proposal or not, or they were just going to put it straight to members and accept it, uh, was that we read out from around the country what the votes were from every other higher education branch that was, you know, so we were, and it was brilliant, you know, we heard from Newcastle, and it was like, Newcastle were voted this many to nothing, Liverpool were voted this many to nothing, Sheffield were voted this many, and it, you really felt like, you know, one, physically because you're there, but also you knew that across the country, people were having the same arguments that you were, that were saying, we're not willing to throw in the town now, uh, we can fight and we can win and we can get something much better. Uh, a, a brief thing on transforming UCU. I mean, I, I talk about transforming UCU. I've only been in it for a year. Uh, I don't really know <laughs> what it was like before 16,000 uh, new people joined. I can tell you that they didn't just join because there was free membership. They joined because we had political arguments on the picket lines. They feared for their pensions. They knew that if we gave up this little bit around pensions, they were going to come for our pay next. Surprise. Uh, you know, now uh, they're willing to fight. And I think what we have to do, as, as others have said, is obviously um, to build UCU left and to build uh, campaigns and, and, and to fight. But we've got to get the vote out for these next campaigns now. And we've got to continually continue to think about what is the kind of education system we want in this country that we are fighting for around the world. Because it's not one that is run for profit. It's not one that says, you can have this many students uh, from this country, we're going to put quotas on it, and so forward. Um, and, and finally, I just want to say something about the role of a uh, socialist worker, because I think um, the socialist worker newspaper and the, like the, the Socialist Workers' Party played such a crucial role in this dispute. I really don't think that we would have continued uh, to fight throughout the whole of that 14 days if it wasn't for, especially activists in this room, uh, not myself, who uh, fought on the NEC, who've gone throughout the union, but also been outward looking and saying what we need to do now is we need a transformative moment. We need to fight for this strike. We need to win because if we don't win, that's uh, higher education down uh, the drain. And so it's really a, a call to you all 
to, to go back, to fight in, in universities and workplaces. And by the way, I, I want to hear from everyone in this room because I want to know if this is, was, was this what it was like for you? And, and if you're not at a university or not in a college, if you're in a different type of workplace, what's it like in, in your kind of workplace? Because we were always told, you know, we're the most docile ones, academics won't fight, and all of a sudden, they're, they're fighting. Uh, almost literally, uh, and so please, please do in the discussion. Uh, you know, is 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 this relatable and, and so on? But I also want to uh, just end on to say that um, oh, I can't read my own writing. Uh, I'm going to end on by just saying that I, I think um, you know, if if you if you've been inspired in this dispute, if you want to continue to fight against corporatization and marketization of higher education, then do join the SWP or consider it, come and talk to us. But more importantly, let's continue this fight into the autumn and let's make sure that we win uh, our pay ballots and we, we fight to win uh, pensions as well. You'll have to wrestle it off me. <laughs> Says get to three minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to, because there'll be people in the room who are not in uh, um, UCU. I mean, you can tell that we're all a bit euphoric over the last few months. But actually, had to try and contextualise this in what's actually happening uh, to the, uh, in, in the battle about neoliberalism. Because you think about the junior doctor's dispute that really was a precursor for us, and you think about what's happening now, you can see that there's been a transformation taking place in the position you find yourself in if you work in one of these institutions now. The idea of what your job was like as a lecturer some years ago is completely different. You go into any of our universities now, something like 21 billion is set aside in assets uh, it, it, that's it, for, for Oxford and Cambridge alone, and only one college pays the London living wage. Only one. Uh, not London, the National Living Wage, the only one accredited. And inside our universities, we have many, many low-paid women workers who are on part-time casual contracts and so on, who are watching their chances of progression and moving forward, stifled by what's happening. So you start off, you do all you're supposed to do in life to have a good job. And the ones that, that, who've actually been there several years are finding their pensions are being attacked, and those who've just got in there are seeing the whole thing going to hell in a handcart. And I think that's part of the reason neoliberalism is failing education. That's our starting point. And that does mean that if we do what we did in, in these campaigns, which is br bring together uh, everybody, uh, not just uh, the long-standing old members who've been hanging around the branch committee for years, but actually engage with the new forces that are in our workplaces and keep a political uh, eye on what's going on outside. It's no accident, of course, that we have UCU uh, uh, left has, and uh, SWP in particular has been supporting the action of uh, the cleaners uh, in London who have been fighting over rights, the McDonald strike, and also looking at what's happening with refugees and asylum uh, seekers and so on, bringing the politics into the workplace as well. And I think that's really quite important in how you feed into the struggle. Uh, the nuts and bolts of what you do is also not to underestimate how people feel. The fact is pay is a very real issue. People's lives are being squeezed. If One of the things that I think has been interesting is that these strikes have been certainly in FE, and I think even to some extent in HE, they've been offensive strikes. It's not been settled for a compromise and moved back down. It's actually we want something new. I think in the HE, as the dispute went on, the demands expanded, and I think that was very, very important and a very important role that we had to play. So politics is important at the centre of these disputes. Thank you, Comrade. I, I should have just mentioned um, this is being filmed, so if, if you don't want to be filmed, can you please let me know before you speak? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm John Parrington from Oxford University, and I just wanted to talk a bit about our experience at Oxford, because we have exactly the same sort of thing, mass picket lines, all these new people, 50% new members, branch transformed, you know, unprecedented number of people on the branch committee. But we also saw a slightly different thing going on, because we have this parallel um, structure in Oxford called the Congregation. It's basically a throwback to the time when Don's academics had some kind of say over what happened in the university. And, and in theory, it means that we can come together in the Sheldonian Theatre, designed by Sir Christopher Wren, uh, and debate and, and decide policy in the university. And it still, as it stands, as a democratic body. And we got, we, when the pensions dispute started, we, we, we said we want to have a debate in, in congregation. Uh, and so all the Dons turned up in all, all the senior academics and administrators in their gowns and the rest of it. And we'd already got wind that the fact that the VC was going to try and block the, the, the debate and the vote. 
Uh, and I think the tension actually got to the uh, senior proctor, who's this guy in his college robes, and the rest of it who, who does the proceedings in the congregation. Because he was supposed to say, I'm now about to move the resolution. And instead he said, I'm now about to move the revolution, which was obviously a bit of a Freudian slip. But what happened next really did show this sort of change of feeling and the anger in, in the university because the, the VC did try and block the debate and, and the vote through this archaic uh, rule where, whereby you need to give a certain amount of notice and if 20 people stand up then they can block it. And when these people did that then there was uproar, everybody was shouting you know, shame and all the rest of it. And instead of just sitting there meekly taking this, we all marched outside, outside the Sheldonian in the sort of historic quad of the university and we did a show of hands, you know a good old fashioned show of hands and we voted uh, to, 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 to have our resolution and we all voted for it. Next day, the VC completely backs down the ruling council and says, we've changed our mind. We will make sure that pensions in Oxford stays exactly the same. And that's obviously a big victory for us and something we, we need to co commit them to and also make sure that's the, a rule for the rest of the country. But I think one thing that we, we, we need now need to do is to really think how we build on this because it has to be said that, you know, there's all these other institutions in Oxford. There's Oxford Brooks, there's Ruskin. We need really, to, I think, to build a forum where we can, we can debate and we can really get an activist network that's, that's a across the, the city, not just the university. But also, we've really got to link all this back to the, the student issues, and we had great support from the students. But, you know, it's like other institutions. I teach medicine. I have students about to do their exams sick, you know, vomiting repeatedly before the exam. They're anxious about, about the exams. And so tackling all these different things about student stress, the fact that, you know, in Oxford... I think two-thirds of people are, who teach there are, are temporary. It's an incredible thing in an institution that's supposed to be, you know, the, one of the top institutions in, in the world in education. So, so there's lots, lots of exciting things going on, but a huge challenge in trying to really build on this in the future. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. I'm not a member of the SDP, I'm a member of the Labour Party, but what I'm going to say is actually quite praiseworthy of the SDP to start with, but not all of it you might imagine. I'm from York, University of York. We're on strike, usual big picket lines, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely fantastic. 25% uh, union gr membership growth, I think. We had a bet with Sean. Sean did actually beat me in the end, though I was ahead for quite a while on our, our, our growth rates. And it's all very great, but I think what I need to stress is the importance of being organised long term. This, this old saying about somebody being a success overnight after years of hard work. Well, this dispute was years in the making. And people like Sean Wallace and... Uh, I uh, can't remember your name, sorry. They were the ones who, t who did all the hard work, put the work in. I'll tell you a little story. I've known Sean now for 20 years. He's my BFF. And I'm in a, a, an exec meeting, and this guy comes in hurried and goes, oh, have you read this? Have you read this? It's brilliant. It's the latest Sean Wallace. And I think, the what? And he's got, and he's going, oh, is this, for this guy is somewhere in London. He's got this brilliant blog. That's, it's all the information about what's going in the university. He's, he wrote this white paper, this alternative white paper, etc. And he's just going on. I thought, this is Sean. This is my mate, Sean. Now, this is like, could talk anyone to death. He's absolutely pleased with But the point was, Sean's blog became the go-to thing for information because the, one of the leaders of our union is Joanna de Groot. If, if this was a pantomime, you get to boo when we mention her name. She's president of the union. And she was really stifling debate. She, in the, she, she has a, a, a very strong control over our We're a small union and we're a relatively weak union. Uh, by UCU standards at York, and she was definitely there. But what was happening was the people were saying, what's Sean saying? When they knew, heard I knew Sean, I'd stayed at his house, and all this kind of, that's kind of famous as well, and people would be getting in touch asking me. And we set up a, a mailing list for activists in the union, separate from the actual, so quite a few people are in the union, but weren't on strikes. So we had a separate activist mailing list. And then this mailing list, we're obviously distributing information. And that was set up, so a little bit, by a guy who'd only joined the union six months before, who was a professor, who I had helped when he had really bad problems at work. He'd, he'd, he'd historically been in the union, but he'd left because basically the union was a bit shit. But he rejoined because we helped him over his... Uh, wanted to go part-time, his mother was very ill, wanted to live away from stuff. And we put the effort in and we beat it. HR were being absolute bastards about it, the dean was being bastards about it. And we got him what he wanted. And he rewarded us by setting up mailing lists, by going to picket lines, by being out on strike, all this kind of thing. So it's all this little organisation on the ground is really important. And I got an email on that mailing list, actually, which kind of some of the situation that when, when it came to the sell-out deal, and then people were panicking, and Joanna de Groot was made nasty, unpleasant emails to all the rest of the exec telling us to grow up, we were childlike, we just get excited on the picket line. This is what she actually said in an email, which I believe I copied to Sean. And we were able to respond to that because I got an email on the mailing list and it said, what has John's Carlo said? 
And that's what the question was put on our, on our, on our activist list. What has John Carlos said? I got the credit, but it was all Carlos' work. And I, I knew of Carlos' work through Sean, the links, the networks, the activist things that go on that. So that's really important to actually build. These things don't happen overnight. And so I'm therefore going to give a slightly criticism of the SWP, because the attitude seems to be join the SWP with the best activists. Joanna de Groot has stopped being president of the union. She's returned to York. She's reimposed herself. And when we tried to block her at an exact meeting for her placeholder, who was the president while she was away, stepped down, kind of, kind of you know, it was, shouldn't have surprised us, but it kind of took us by surprise. She stepped down in the meeting, said, I'm not going to be president anymore. Joanna's returned. Let's elect Joanna. And David Houston, who's an activist, un unaligned activist, looks around. Uh, uh, sorry. But he proposed a co an SWP member to take over. He said, no, no, don't let Joanna come in. This individual should do it. And this individual, who had been very inactive during the strike, actually, was, was quite ill those SDP, looked at his feet, stepped back and said, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. And by the time that had gone through, Joanna's back in president, and we're now having more problems within the union. So it's, it's important to keep building and to take positions when you get the opportunity to build the union. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Jean Evanson. I'm in the National Education Union. Um, so I'm going to answer some of your uh, questions, Josh, so, um, because asking about what it looks like from outside. Um, and obviously we share education as a theme, um, and I think that there's a lot of parallels. Well, firstly, I want to say how utterly inspiring your strike has been from the outside. I mean, 14 days, that's incredible. Um, in terms of what I, th um, what I was thinking about the links with neoliberalism, I mean, one of the fights we have in the, um, in the NEU, I have to keep saying that, not the NUT, the NEU, is against academisation. And academisation is, of course, all about neoliberalism. And we had a strike in 2015, which was, um, I think it was 2015, um, which was against Nicky Morgan's plan to enforce academisation everywhere, so basically every school would become a business. And we had a strike then, and um, <laughs> we had one day, <laughs> which I think frustrated a lot of our members, to be honest. However, we did put a spoke in the wheel, and I think the reason we put a spoke in the wheel, uh, and that policy did, have, did get withdrawn, is because we were out there with that political argument, and we were engaging with people, we were engaging with people on the streets. Um, now, I actually work in a sixth form college in the post-16 sector, so um, <laughs> that meant I couldn't go on strike on, on, that, on that, but I, we went out on our lunchtime and we went and talked to people on the streets and talked about what will academisation mean for your, for your children. Um, and I think that's something we, we can take together. We can take together the arguments about education out to the public and what the effect that neoliberalism has on education, what it means in terms of mental health for professionals, what it means in terms of mental health for our young people, what it means in terms of, of cuts and, and funding cuts. And that's the other thing we're doing in the NEU all the time is linking it with funding. So I think our, our big fight next is going to be on pay, but we're going to link that very much with funding. And I hope we're out there with you and I hope we are out to build towards something near a general strike. Sounds good to me. Right. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, hi, uh, just to uh, introduce myself, my name is Nadia. Um, I'm a member of the Socialist Worker Party. Um, I'm actually a student, only for a little bit longer. Um, I'm graduating this year. Not really interested in going to the ceremony, but I have to. But the only good thing about it is the fact that where that graduation ceremony is going to be taking place is a building that me and other students actually occupied during the strikes. Um, so it makes it a little bit less <laughs> bad to have to go to your graduation ceremony. I don't know if that's a headache for other people. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to talk about, I mean, how inspiring the strikes really were because um, I remember, like, as soon as uh, they had happened, I mean, I think it inspired a lot of students to see, number one, you know, the, the threshold actually being completely smashed um, in the vote for the strike, but also, you know, the sort of turnout that was happening on the picket lines and so on. And the fact that even in the course of that strike, the UCU elected its first uh, black vice president, which I'm exceptionally proud to call a comrade as a black woman myself. I mean, people were really radicalizing in that, and I don't think it was just the lecturers, it was the students as well. Um, Two things um, I want to make a point about. One to do with uh, the strikes themselves. I mean, I remember when I was in my first year of university, there was actually a UCU strike. Um, very, very different. I think it was over pay. Very, very different. Uh, didn't last very long. The picket light, the, the buzz and the atmosphere around it was not the same. There wasn't a buzz. Um, 
I'd, I'd imagine that dispute wasn't won. Um, I didn't really keep up with what had happened, but those were the first picket lines I went to. And, you know, to think two years later, how dramatically transformed. Obviously, this has a lot to do with the scale of the pension attacks, but also the increase in moods two years on against austerity and so on. But I think one of the things that made this strike so brilliant that was a difference I noticed uh, from the previous year is the fact that, you know, they were striking consecutively for such a long amount of time. I saw in these uh, course of strikes, you know, the picket lines actually growing and people winning other lecturers and so on onto the picket lines. And I think it's a lesson we've got to take back to our unions and so on if we're not in the UCU. The fact that we need to fight for long strikes where we can actually build and grow, not just, you know, people coming out at once and so on. Um, just observations of a student. <laughs> Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention as well was, you know, something we, um, exp I mean, it's no surprise at all that, you know, when the strikes were happening, a lot of the teach outs and so on that were organized that students and lecturers together demanded were around racism, where it, whether it was decolonizing your curriculum, how are we going to take on uh, the rise of racism on our campuses and so on. Um, at Queen Mary, where I study, um, we had uh, outside of the principal's office um, in the main building, uh, what we were having on the picket lines as well was actually these honk for pension signs to make work as hard as possible for him, which worked a treat. And most of the time people would honk, oh my God, the truckers were the best as well. <laughs> um, but I remember uh, helping one of the uh, strikers with that and somebody had shouted like through his car while he was stopped at the uh, traffic light, go back to work. Um, I actually saw that guy and recognized him on the 9th of June. Um, and I think it, you know, not to say that everyone who's anti-strikes and so on is a racist and a fascist, but I think we've got to realize that actually we've got to marry these two fights together. You know, the fact that people, uh, when they're on strike, wanted to talk about, you know, the rise in racism and so on, I think is is in part to do with the fact that, you know, the marketization of education, but also the fact that this government constantly wants to see the big problem in education on migrant uh, students and workers or even Muslims through things like prevent. People are fucking sick of it. For them, the biggest problem on the campuses is things like pay. It's things like tuition fees and so on. And that's why I think, I mean, the picture shows perfectly well, the UCU is a part of Stand Up to Racism and Stand Up to Racism was at the forefront of those strikes organizing and, and so on. I, I was actually on the banner there. Um, but I think everyone needs to come out as well on the, on the 13th of June, uh, July, uh, and the 14th of July as well, because I think we need to marry these two fights against the austerity, but the racism they're trying to excuse it with. Thank you. Hi, uh, Leslie McGorgan. I work at Leeds University, and I've been on the NEC of UCU for the last six years. I just wanted to say... Um, give a little bit of the details about how we got to that place where our rank and file membership overturned the bureaucracy in the USS strike. Um, and for us at Leeds, and I'm sure it was the same everywhere else, what we did, we set out very, very publicly showing that we aimed to win this one. I think we felt confident because the bureaucracy had actually called the 14 days. Um, but I think like Josh, many of us thought the strike would end very early. The bureaucracy would call it off. Um, but we set out to, to prove not only to our employers, but to the bu uh, bureaucrats that we were serious. And in doing that, uh, very, very early on, a dynamic emerged. Um, so locally, for us at Leeds, that meant having lots of extra local meetings. And we started having different motions. We were discussing motions about how we were going to spend our funds, the amount of our reserves. That we said, you know, that rainy day's come, we're going to spend our hardship fund. We talked about the details of how much the van would cost that we were going to hire for 14 days and that we were getting a new gazebo. It made the strike feel very, very real. It was going to happen. It was going to go forward. And uh, hopefully it was going to win. And again, like people have talked about the teach outs, we booked a venue, very expensive, but we booked it for 14 full days like we knew we were going to see, see this out. And uh, I think it just really paid off. Uh, what it meant was every day on those picket lines, after seeing day one on social media and the national media, people who hadn't been there thought, I want to be part of that. And they came the next day and new people came the next day and the next day, as others have um, said. I mean, we had an example, the snow up in Leeds, as you can imagine, was phenomenal. Some people couldn't get in some days. Uh, one of our members actually walked seven miles and we gave him a, an award for walking the furthest to get to the picket line. Um, 
Also alongside that, we got an absolutely fantastic flourishing of creativity. Our branch uh, president dubbed the, the, the lyrics uh, of Spice Girls, uh, Spice Up Your Life, to strike up your life. And we, we videoed that and it kind of went viral. But then we got older um, members, 60-year-olds, wanting their era of songs. So they'd turn up the next day with their own lyrics typed up and printed out. And uh, day after day, new people uh, were there with their own anti-neoliberal university, anti-pensions uh, songs. So really... Um, the kind of, you know, my message is when you act like you're serious, when you act like you're the winning side, uh, you've got wit and you use bright ideas, um, you really can transform your union and then you start to become a magnet, which is really what we felt. Throughout that, union members stood massively tall. People grew day by day in that struggle. Friendships were formed. People are now walking around campus, you know, saying hello to people that they've worked with for 20-odd years and, and have never spoken to before. But these people really felt a sense of liberation. It, it was absolutely phenomenal. And I think it's no co coincidence that one of my comrades at Leeds, it was actually during that strike that that person, who after 70 years um, managed to um, come out as transgender, I don't think it was coincidence that that happened on the picket lines. So, um, you know, it all culminated in the fantastic slogan that we were using we are the university and then subsequently when the union bureaucrats have tried to stamp on us actually we are the union Uh, yeah, I'm Steph, I'm a teacher, I'm also in the National Education Union and a lot of what I wanted to say has kind of been said but I wanted to um, also talk about, uh, it's sort of been touched on what's education for and, and I think as well more broadly the public services um, I'm a teacher, I'm married to an academic and I keep saying to him that what they've done to us, they're coming for you <laughs> They're coming for you and you see this systematic, the underfunding of the services when they brought in student loans, I was like, I will never, ever pay off my student loan. I will pay that for the rest of my working life. What did they gain from doing that? I didn't understand it at the time, but I understand now because students now, when my son went to university, it's all about what you're paying because you're a customer. So they've monetized education and they've marketized education. So the universities are competing with each other and the way academics... I know when I was a student, I had no idea really what the life of an academic was like. And it seems they're bringing in the same as they've done for teachers, all these um, you know, statistics on your performance in this area, that area, the other area. How do you compare? You know, and, and they've done it to us. They're doing it to the universities. They've done it to the health service. And they just think, well, I get accused a bit at home sometimes of being like a conspiracy theorist because it because you see this systematic way of running down a service and devaluing it and devaluing the profession to then what will happen next i am totally expecting like amazon universities to pop up where they you don't even have to go you know you just have to pay your money and they'll give you your degree and then you can you know it <laughs> yeah and, and whilst it seems a bit far-fetched in a way, I think that's um, the point I wanted to make was about joining up. So what is education for? And we have to fight for our right for a proper education, not a how many tests can you pass education. But also, more broadly, where is this moving? And it's about fragmenting services. It's about chopping them up and handing them out to private companies. And it's about denigrating us as professionals so that we feel too broken to stop them and that's the bit where we've got to make sure and this is why we have to take inspiration from this isn't it is actually that we're not too broken to stop them and we need to stop them uh, yeah hi sean vanell ucu um yeah just i think the today's meeting obviously is trying to generalize some of the experiences that uh, we have all been through over the last number of years and i think it's an important starting point what uh, some of the comrades in the room have said really that it's all about um, not just the, the, the break 
which you saw from the 14 days, but the continuity as well, the work that gets put in year in, year out. But there is a continuity, but there is a break as well. And so I want to say some one or two things about that, really. I think the continuity is about the hard work, which starts from the branch level, but also at the national executive level, at the regional level, and how you start thinking at strategically how, how to go about this. I mean, for us, I mean, you can read through the whole articles that I and others have written, uh, and, and, and Sean and, and uh, Mandy and others have written throughout over the last God knows how many years on the UCLF website, and you can see this happening. You know, this wasn't the total surprise um, which shocked every, everybody which took place. Of course, you need the ingredients that take place. You need the, a pension attack. You need a pay attack, of course. But that's not enough. There's other formations. And, of course, what drove the dispute, what made it generalised, was the defence of education, the way the last speaker spoke about. And I think that's very really important. So, number one, I'd like to underline, I think the thing to do here, and which Sean, I think, did brilliantly, was um, to challenge the horrible cl cliches, the, narr the narrative, the alternative narratives about the economic question. So, so, for example, we won an argument amongst the rank and file that there is no deficit. This seems obvious now, but at the time, it was an argument at the beginning, certainly amongst some of the left on the executive, or can we put this, Hunt that doesn't believe this argument to this very day, there is not a deficit. So, number one, argument in FE, it was similarly argument, by the way, the money is there, we want our share, was our slogan, which ran through our whole dispute amongst the 12 branches. We convinced our members... Despite being told year in, year out, the money is not there to fund m uh, wages, we convince a whole layer of people that actually it is. Um, and put arguments and, and we backed up the figures and so on. So number one, I think it's important. Alternatives. Don't let them carry the argument. Because if the rank and file has half believe the argument that well, they've got a point about them, the money, the problem is not us, it's the government. You're not going to get us to strike off the ground as simple as that. As soon as you accept an argument, the money isn't there, you shake hands with your employer. It's as simple as that. Sooner or later, you walk down the road and work out where to sign a deal. And that's what was important for this dispute. Very hard for argument about the no deficit or an FE, the money is there. But also, I think, in terms about the speed in which things change. And I, I, that was so amazing about and one of the most brilliant moments I had. I went to um, Sean's workplace and Josh's workplace to deliver a, a solidarity sp uh, a sp uh, support from further education. And as I left the UCI, I walked around the corner to SOAS, and it's of the snow and all the rest of it, a freezing cold day, and there were 50 Muslim students who refused to cross a picket line, and it was on a Friday, and did their prayers on the grass verge outside. And you thought, oh, this is different, isn't it? This is something which is rather special, and we haven't seen the like of before. And I'm sure we all can give lots of different examples of the, the interlinking between the student struggles and that of... Uh, of the star struggles, and, the, and therefore the speed in which we can go years and years, and come, we can come very conservative. You build a UCU left, you build branch meetings, and so on and so forth. And when things move so quickly, you are then running like, you know, hell to catch up with what, what people are doing. And I think that's an important message out of the dispute. You don't have to wait 25 years of sectional struggle to bring about rank and file organisation. You can see overnight, if you've got the right arguments at the right time, putting them, putting them in the right place and moving very quickly and being audacious, and it, it, will, it will connect the rank of file as usual, always step up to the mark and fight, and then you can start to re-raise all sorts of arms within it about equality, about anti-racism, about sexism, about awful discrimination within it, which strengthens that movement. That is the lesson, it seems to me, of, of, of our dispute. The main division inside our union isn't between left and right, it's between the bureaucracy and the rank and file. What we've saw to this over this dispute was a revolt of the rank and file which stopped them not once by the way but twice once on the no capitulation but when it came to the congress it was the most, most ridiculous tactical madness I've ever seen by any general secretary trying to stop criticism the rank and file once again rose, its, ro rose up and stopped them what's happened now she's had to retreat and they have to recall congress they're going to have to discuss uh, those two motions on, on, on censure and on, on, on resignation again a victory for the rank and file an organisation. They're not giving up the second, the, the, ref, the motions, the Democracy Commission, which is coming up, as well as the, um, the second, uh, the call for a second referendum, is something they're going to use to try and split our side. But I think we're well organised, with the pay struggles taking place, with strong political arguments, we can continue to push them back. Um, maybe just to try and follow on from that a little bit, um, over the whole theme of uh, change and continuity, because um, I don't want to talk about experiences at Imperial because you've been hearing a lot of that and you'll hear a lot of that anytime you sit down with anybody that's been involved in the USS strikes, you'll get a long stream of uh, such brilliant stories. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, what I do want to talk about is um, the fact that you know, we're in a situation where lots of people are looking to a Corbyn government to deliver change. 
Now, the remarkable thing about the Labour leadership is that both John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn have visited picket lines and have um, quite publicly expressed their support for strikes, and that's something that's very, very new. The difficulty is, is that the, the Labour Party is, if you like, the political expression of the trade union leaders. That's where it actually comes from, and that's how it was created. And what that means is that in the run-up to the election, you are seeing less and less um, enthusiasm on the part of our union leaders um, for strikes because they believe that that actually undermines the prospect of getting the Labour government elected because it introduces controversy, it introduces conflict and all the rest of it. So it's not so much, you know, it, 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 the problem isn't the Labour, the, the Labour leadership. The Labour leadership, you know, are, are clearly encouraging us all not to wait for them and to fight in the here and now. The problem is, is that the resistance to that is coming from people, A, that don't believe that workers can fight and win. And that was a problem in our dispute. That's basically why we had a dirty deal tried to be imposed on us. And then another, not quite so dirty deal, successfully imposed on us because... The, our leadership didn't believe it was possible to win. I mean, I remember the kind of arguments that we were having in Imperial from the right wing in our union were very, very much, you know, you've been unrealistic to say there's no deficit. In other words, lots of these people accept, to be, they, they do accept the idea that we have to swallow austerity, that the money is not there, and all the rest of it. And therefore, there's a huge amount of pressures in terms of the bureaucracy's ability to sell us that deal. There's actually a direct relationship between that and how strong the left is on the ground. We were strong enough to stop the first sellout. We were not strong enough to, set, to stop the second one. And therefore, that, you know, the, the conclusion is we need more socialists in the, in the UCU. It's not, we don't just need a, a bigger you know, left inside the union. We need more socialists in every workplace that are capable of organizing people around them in such a way that we can stop that kind of thing happening and again and you know we were in a brilliant position if we had actually completely and utterly stopped that attack on our pensions um, then we would be in a very different situation to the one that we're in now and I think that therefore we need to be looking forward to the possibilities that have been shown to us by the, but by the incredible solidarity and spontaneity of that strike and look into some of the brilliant things that we were able to achieve because of the confidence that came out of it. But I think it does come back to the need to build the fight on the ground in the here and now because that's going to shape the potential and the possibilities that do occur should there be a Labour government elected. Uh, Des McDermott, I'm the uh, chair of Ruskin College UCU in Oxford, um, and uh, we, we, get, we straddle FE and HE, so we get both barrels of neoliberalism. Um, and that's really important, because actually the, the HE dispute, we're in the HE dispute because we're part of the USS, um, and uh, our members uh, went on strike uh, the first 14 days. And I just want to echo the importance of ideas, political ideas, because... Um, what we saw in our college, although it's got a sort of famous name, it's associated with the labour movement, one of the first colleges to provide education to working class people in the 19th century. It's also got the legacy of Fabianism, top down, look to the bureaucracy and all that stuff. So during the strike, we, we did a number of things. We, we explained what was going on. We made the connections between the neoliberalism and the attacks on our college, because it's very easy for, for even people on the left to say, oh, well, this is because such and such, or such and such a manager, or, or give sort of a, a personal uh, opinions, rather than saying, no, this is about politics. We're being attacked because of the crisis of, of neoliberalism, um, and we're being made to pay for it. And that really resonated on our picket lines. So we had 14 days of, of a picket line, um, where no one crossed our picket line in that 14 days. So, and that, and that was really important that no one crossed the picket line because we were also sending a message to students that we really needed your support. It, we, we needed, and the students were fantastic. I mean, I'm sure that's a, the case in most uh, colleges, but the students at Ruskin were absolutely fantastic. They were, you know, they were there at seven in the morning getting everything organized with us. Um, and we gave them a, a thank you by when we, we, cause we, I negotiated with our management. We, we were in a quite unique position because our manager, our manager, our principal is not part of the University of UK. So a first joint negotiating committee where we nego negotiate with management, I said, well, you're not a part of it. So what, what's your view on the, dis on the pension dispute? Um, and they said, well, you know, we're independent. And I said, well, you can't be independent. At Ruskin, everyone's in the union, including our management. So uh, everyone's in UCU, including our management. So I said to them, well, if you, if you support us then, that means you should pay for everyone being on strike, including all our visiting tutors, and we managed to win that position. So everyone, so the, the incentive was, if you join the picket line, you'll get paid. I think it was probably the first time in history. So everyone who joined the picket line got paid. And that, 
And that was really important because I, I just want to finish on this point. What, what the strike did, it, we, we saw the, 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 what the bureaucracy can do. It can support, the, support action and then it can, it can turn it off. But what it also did is allowed ordinary people to, make, to join up the dots, to make connections between uh, precarious work and some of the you know, casualization, some of the worst things that's happened in education to say, actually, all of this is the fault of neoliberalism. They're not all strong. When we get organized and we fight back, we can beat them. Yeah, I think the big picture of this is the important thing. People try to outline at the, at the, at the beginning because the university sector and college sectors, they're big business. That's what they are. They're enormous business. In, in, to, to, and therefore, what people's concept of a university was, a place of learning where students would interact with their lecturers and the people around them and the rest of it, this is like something from the Stone Age. It's got nothing to do with the conception that the people at the top of university structures have. And therefore, we're not talking about caring communities, nurturing students, worrying about staff and the rest of it. We're talking about huge, in, you know, internationally linked institutions that are there about making money and large amounts of it uh, with it. And actually, what the, the strike did was it began to challenge that conception. Right, so over it. I mean, I'm, I'm going to a meeting at UCL, actually, where I left at the same time as Josh did, because he went to speak another trade union meeting to look for solidarity. And about four or five, there's 150 people at the meeting. It's a really big meeting, and it was a bit weird because about four or five hours later, I went back to the same spot to pick something up, and there were still 150 people in the room arguing with each other, debating, discussing, and the rest of it. Really, it's a vote because people were suddenly getting a kick out of the processes and stuff, not just the debates about the strike or pensions and the rest of it, but the conception of actually beginning to run your own university. The archaeology department at, 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 at UCL produced daily bulletins, right, stuff with joke lists. And I mean, yeah, you go through the whole thing of it. Suddenly people who had never actually met each other, even though they'd worked 10 yards away from each other for years, started to be friends. Go out, have a chat, debate stuff. Go and actually the concept of a university becoming a place of learning where students were coming to teachings, where people were learning from one another and the rest of it. So that is a massive thing really. It's something we don't want to lose from what happened in a dispute and we have to learn about future disputes as well. Two other quick things. One is about casualisation. Because we hear all the time that casualisation is this evil disease, you know, and stuff that, and really, what can you do about this? Well, we've got the example, haven't we, and stuff about McDonald's and the strikes there and the rest of it. But actually, probably more casualised workers were involved in the USS dispute than probably any other dispute in the bloody nation's history so far. And stuff uh, uh, over it, really, stuff. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who quite often had no link to the pension scheme or a tenuous link were on the picket lines and the rest of it. Last thing of all was about strike action. Because the point is that before this, there was a big debate inside the union, the college union stuff over, we have to be very clever now, we have to understand that national strikes don't work. We have to, you know, what, what actually caused the, the, the grumpus here? Calling 14 days of strike action and up in the ante continually. So the employers were rocked from the beginning, right, stuff, because people were actually trying to win a strike. They weren't coming out for one day to apologise for the fact that they were striking. And all the things you look at the pictures and the rest of it, because there was a call from the top underneath it, rank and file organisation, the big demos in London, the teachings, the marches, all the rest of it, built up the pressure. It's a beautiful little example to start spread, spread, spreading out. That One is strike action works, that if you politicise the strike action, it works even more. That if you explain the issues and explain the fact that the bastards at the top are to blame, and it's not just some you know, evil process, it's a part of a whole system that's against you uh, around it, that also works further. And actually, what, what was the end result? 16,000 people joined the union. The unions are losing members, not gaining them. 16,000 joined and stuff over it. And we have to spread this as an example. Right, so that if you bloody fight and you fight politically, you can galvanise a whole new generation into joining the unions. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Jingwei. I'm from China. So I'm from uh, I'm a professor of Wuhan University. I'm from School of Marxism. So uh, now I'm visiting professor of King's College. So I want to introduce some Chin China, you know, uh, 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 some uh, edu education. So uh, you know, I'm from School of Marxism. So in China, every university have 
one school, this school name School of Marxism. Yeah, surely, so, uh, yeah, so I want to say, you know, Marxism have a uh, high, high top, uh, top rank and in China, and uh, every student uh, must uh, take uh, uh, courses and the class, uh, classes, you know, uh, we must uh, educate Marxism to every university student. So I think, uh, yeah, it's very good. So uh, this is the first. Uh, the second, I want to say, uh, uh, in China, uh, undergraduate students uh, uh, usually pay uh, uh, maybe, I think, low tuition to university. And the master student and the PhD student, uh, uh, we don't need to pay tuition to university. University gave money every month for uh, you know for students. Uh, yeah, uh, I remember last year uh, in my school we ha we have we hold uh, we hold uh, international conference. So I inv invented two professor. You know, uh, they come from. Uh, Britain University, they give lectures, uh, uh, they ask, ask uh, you know, my school student, my, stu uh, my, my, my student told them, so we don't need to pay any money to university, we get money from university every month. So I remember this professor say, oh, it's really socialism. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this, uh, so I think, uh, so I, I, you know, I come here, I very enjoy this conference. Usually, so you know, my major is, uh, my research is about uh, uh, Marxism, not just the Marxism. So, I think as uh, uh, sanitization Marxism in China, I want to. I want to, uh, yeah, I want to maybe, uh, I want to, uh, uh, many Western people to know a uh, choose China, yeah, really. So, yeah, really. So, <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm so sorry. So, uh, uh, if, you know, I know here many university professors, if you uh, want to learn more about uh, and uh, maybe want to establish academic, I, I think, uh, yeah, we can talk about uh, after the, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank okay, th thanks very much to all the speakers. I'm going to invite the, uh, the, the panel speakers just to quickly come back in for a minute each. Okay, so I thought, I mean, it, it, Marxism is about the self-emancipation of the working class. And it's about the transformation in struggle where people become a move from being passive uh, workers who are, who are subject to, 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 to workplace discipline to being leaders and to being transformed by the process of struggle. And it can only be achieved by struggle. And we saw that in our strikes. I'm not claiming that what we saw in the, in the universities was a revolution. But what I'm saying is, is that the process that you see in revolutions, you see in the strikes like these. So they become, the mass nature of the strike, the scale of the strike, and the power of the strike itself transforms the understanding of the people who participated in it such that the arguments about uh, marking boycotts became about how do we execute a marking boycott by striking. Now, we didn't win the argument with a, layer of, uh, with a larger enough layer of people that we would have been able to hold strikes during the marking period such that the, the marking would not have taken place. But nobody thought we wouldn't be able to actually win it. The problem was that people were worried about the po political um, consequences of doing that. We were in uncharted territory. Maybe next year we may be forced to do that. And we need to think about how we articulate that argument if it is the, ca as the case, as Carlo suggested, that the JEP comes back and says that, you know, there's a deficit. This goes to the, Sean's point about the political argument about there being no deficit. is extremely important because if you don't start from that, you don't start from the premise that you can win. And if you don't start from the premise you can win, you don't get people out and you don't get that power in the first place. So, I mean, I, I just think that there's... I want to just end with the three, three lessons that we learned from the strike. Number one... What we learned in the strike, number one, strikes have power. That we can stop lectures and we can stop the university. 
Number two, that power comes from unity, that by coming out together, we could, we could win. And thirdly, you can't trust the union leaders. And there's, there's a generation of people who are now in the universities, in our union, who understand those three points. And that, that's the basis on which we can transform the union going forward. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I just want to pick up a, on a couple of points. Um, the student solidarity that we had during the strike, yes, kudos to all the students that supported us. Um, and I think you, you made us stronger. Uh, we stood with you and you stood with us. So I just want to say a big thank you to the students. Um, we talked about, I talked originally about the structures of the union. And Roddy, are you still here? Oh, Roddy. Roddy works at Imperial College, and he has already started changing the structures within his uh, organization. There is somebody there who is like extremely right wing, who has been standing for branch, for, for branch positions year in, year out, uh, a known IBLer. This year, uh, and it, uh, th there wasn't even, you didn't even know that this was going to happen, did you, Roddy? They, they went to a branch meeting, and all of a sudden there was an election. And the arrogant IBL has stood, and our Roddy won. So the message, and is it Ra Raj, Vijay. Vijay? Vijay also stood as well. And the point is that the IBL has been, you know, the IBL have shown uh, to, to, to be what they are. Rank and file now understand that the IBLers are standing, uh, standing in front of of us as a progressive union. We need to strike. The IBLers don't strike, and people are getting to understand that. Um, and that's what I wanted to say. And just, just to you know, sort of like summarize what Nye Bevan said 70 years ago as well. Uh, neoliber he didn't say neoliberalism, but he says a public service like, like the NHS, public service like education, does not belong, belong in the marketplace. A playground cannot be turned into a marketplace. A playground needs to stay a, a playground. We are educationalists. We are not business people, and we need to keep on banging on about that. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, really quick for, from me, because I'm actually, spe shameless plug, speaking next with John Bellamy Foster on America. How exciting. Um, just to, yeah, so three points, and that's, you know, um, I think it was Roddy or, and other people have obviously mentioned, and it's a theme that's gone throughout the whole of Marxism this year, about that we can't wait for Labour, that we can't wait, uh, you know, a few years, um, you know, until the next election and, and, and Corbyn comes in, uh, as great that's going to be, and a new education service and fit, a national education service. I think what the strike has shown is we can take action now. We can really start to shift the, t the terrain, but we've also got bosses scared. And when bosses are scared, they don't back down, they come back with even more. And, I've, you know, at, at UCL, they've announced that, you know, a, a new round of casualization, they're bringing in Unitemps. We know that at South Bank, um, they're under attack, massive job cuts, redundancies. Uh, Liverpool University, ma massive job cuts. So the bosses aren't backing down. We need to keep building the momentum. And uh, that's why, you know, these ballots over pay uh, about keeping, you know, what happens with the JEP now around USS is so central. And that's why we need to fight to get the vote out for those things. Uh, but we can never go back to those one-day strikes. And just finally from me, I think the, one of the things that I loved about the teach-outs and the teach-ins and I've realized it this weekend, is that they kind of reminded me of Marxism. Because it was like all of a sudden, you're in a university building, but you're actually talking about shit that matters. And you actually get to think about, you know, the, the cool, exciting textbooks that you wish that you could, you know, the themes that you wish that you could teach and you wish that you could uh, debate with students and our students. Uh, so if you want to keep up this momentum, please do join us, join the SWP, and let's keep up the fight and let's transform education uh, for the better.